Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ongoing educational series titled Pet Tumor Board. In this series, we present real-world cases, mostly drawn from my own clinical practice, with the goal of highlighting practical scenarios and extracting meaningful, applicable learning points. Joining me for today's tumor board are several renowned experts in their respective fields. Dr. Dan Petrolax, a medical oncologist from Yale. Dr. Sharif Gami, a nuclear medicine physician from UC San Diego. Dr. Wayne Brisbane, a urologist from UCLA. And finally, Dr. Sean Collins, a radiation oncologist from the University of South Florida. None of our panelists have reviewed these cases in advance, ensuring fresh, candid insights. So let's dive in. So this is a 72-year-old MD and PhD researcher. Some medical problems. I saw him with a heat rising PSA, and they had an MRI on the right, which showed a pyrex 4 and 5. He was not very... Didn't, didn't feel very strongly about having the biopsy and didn't want to do it. And he had some travel and put it off. And then uh, I'm sure that we all agree that with this MRI findings and PSA he needs the biopsy. Well, anyway, finally he got the biopsy on November the 6th, a year and a half after the, the original MRI, roughly. And uh, here's our pathology. It's great group. Uh, one on the right side and where the lesion was positive in the, on the MRI at the left base, he had a great group nine, um, and double cores, 80% of the tissue. So what's the next step? Anybody want to comment? Well, with the Gleason 9, we need to image this patient, so I would do a PSMA PET scan on this patient. Okay. Uh, so we're doing a pet tumor board. That sounds like a good thing to do. Um, but it would have been odd coming from me, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, I, when anybody do, uh, I get, you know, what happens is, and somebody brought this up, is a lot of times the companies just, I want to see a bone and CT scan first. And then one of the things that can happen is it may be a, a, a way to get it. So does this guy fit the criteria for high risk as far as you're concerned? Uh, they get a PET scan that, that meets the guidelines. Yeah. Now it's a Gleason 9. I think that's probably one of the big things. Sharif, does that fall within the guidelines? I think this falls well within the guidelines of Gleason 9 and uh, with several lesions. So, uh, yes, uh, mm -hmm. definitely with the rising PSA. Well, let's, uh, I think that uh, you had that uh, PET scan to look at, right? Looks yeah. like something I would say. Yeah. So, any any comments, uh, on, particularly on the PET scan, at the, your report? It's your reports here on the left. I, I mean, it's it's a little sometimes um, difficult for us to talk a little bit about capsular infiltration, seminal vesicle infiltration. To my eyes, and I, again, maybe I in the body I may have mentioned this, but I would also I'm kind of suspicious here that this is. A locally advanced, just by the by the looks of it, re relating to how it tracks along the prosthetic capsule. Uh, in this case, I can't see the seminal vesicles on this image, but it was pretty localized disease. Maybe locally advanced, but localized. And and there was, uh, I mean, the nice thing is you didn't see anything in any osseous lesions, or you said no enlarged nodes or things like that. Okay, what's the next step with um, with him, Doctor Brisbane? I think you you have to have a conversation about his his options for uh, for localized therapy. It sounds like I've caught it within a window. It's concordant with what I would expect with the PSMA or uh, and the PSA that he he could have localized disease, but it's pretty high risk. So I would offer him either a surgical removal uh, with a pel extended pelvic lymph node dissection or a consultation with Dr. Collins. And I would encourage a consultation with radiation oncology and Dr. Petrolak just to kind of talk about radiation with a kind of extended or long-term hormone therapy. Sean, if, if the, this guy saw you, would, would, the, would he be treated with a combination of hormones and what type of radiation would he use? Well, it seems like he's got high-grade disease. It seems like he has high volume, so I'd want to do dose-escalated radiation. 
Um, there's different ways of doing dose escalated radiation. So maybe a combination of pelvic IMRT and brachytherapy, maybe a combination. Um, sometimes at, I use the CyberKnife to replace the brachytherapy. A lot of centers don't have experience in brachytherapy. They might use IMRT and they might do a boost to the PET positive area. Uh, which is called the dominant intraprostatic lesion. This air, this one would be a little bit hard to boost because it's relatively diffuse. It's mm -hmm. not really one spot. It looks like it's involving the left and the right. It also looks like it's potentially involving the prostatic urethra. So boosting the whole tumor to a high dose might be challenging. I would defer to, to Dan about how much uh, hormonal therapy he'd give in this case. Yeah, I mean, I think he needs at least ADT. Uh, the question is, do you add an antiandrogen to this? I mean, I, I only really reserve the antiandrogens for those patients with nodal disease in the situation of doing radiation therapy. So I would do 18 months of ADT along with this. Uh, yeah. The, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, Sean, do, do you think that uh, the PET scan helps you determine what your radiation fields and intensification? And I ask... Wayne, the same thing about surgery, about uh, watching for margins or things like that. I know you're doing some things at UCLA intraoperatively. Sean? For the radiation, I mean, uh, to me, um, this scan, it looks a little diffuse, but very commonly when we order these PSMA scans, we get focal areas of positivity and we can give higher doses of radiation. The nice thing about having the uh, negative lymph node situation is that recent data from India has actually shown that radiating the pelvic lymph nodes in these patients with a negative PET scan actually um, gives them a better chance of cancer control. So in this guy, I'd also be eager to treat his pelvic nodes, even though he had no pelvic lymph node involvement on PSMA scan. These might be the patients who benefit the most from pelvic node treatment, but I'd love to hear other people's opinions. So you're saying basically that I hear that uh, a, a negative PET's nice, but it doesn't, it, it actually is uh, a, a reason to use uh, public lymph node irradiation, correct? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's PSMA scans have a sensitivity of about a half centimeter, which if you have a half centimeter of lymph node, maybe you're not curable. But if you only have microscopic disease in your pelvic lymph nodes, maybe a 45 gray of radiation in five weeks can actually cure you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Wayne, what about you? Does it help in guiding your surgery or anything? Yeah, no, definitely. I think just to kind of, uh, with the nerve spare, obviously on that left side, it's going to be a debatable how useful it is, but, um, it definitely a worth a conversation. And, and then with the, my, one of my partners, Rob Ryder is doing, um, actually a kind of PSMA guided lymphadenopathy or lymphadenectomy where he's using a Geiger counter and kind of going after a specific hot spots. That's on trial, so it's not quite ready for prime time, but it's a uh, very exciting. It's very interesting. I've seen my Dr. Ryder present that. So you're yeah. talking about right here on the scan being uh, of concern. Website. So anyway, he decided to have a radical prostatectomy. This time, I think the urologist was more convincing than the radiation on college. It commonly happens. Yeah, it is. And so it's pre-op PSA is right here, 8.73. Post-op was 0.02. Interestingly, he was downgraded, not having that gleasinate cancer. Uh, I'll show you that in a second, part nine. So right at, you know, for, uh, six weeks after when they did it, he had some incontinence, but he was getting control, uh, was not getting uh, erectile function. So here's his PSA post-operative. Here's his final pathology. And it is a 437, some tertiary five, grade group three. He did have extra prostatic extension. And so uh, I'm wondering if uh, you would talk about that, both of you, about uh, how to follow this guy, starting out with you, Sean. Well, you know, it looks like his uh, PSA uh, natured well 0 0.02, so he's not officially a failure. Um, I usually don't radiate people just for extra prostatic extension. Um, I would probably watch this guy and see how his PSA trends, but I'd love to hear other people's points of view. Yeah. Sure. I would watch this guy and see how his PSA trends. But Dan, you'd watch him? I'd watch him. Any... Uh... 
And uh, what about Dr. Collins? What would you do? You know, the thing is that the, um, first of all, I mean, I think it's really important that his, inco his incontinence improves before you radiate him. If we radiate him now, he's going to have um, lifelong incontinence, most likely. So um, I would definitely wait at least three to six months before doing uh, any radiation. And to me, for even maybe longer, because I really would love for him to get better recovery. He's a doctor, so he'll probably do his Kegel exercises. And by three to six months, he'll probably have continence. Okay. And... um. So, Sharif, how often do we see this uh, uh, down sort of downgrading? How how often that I mean that you can't tell what the grade is from the from the PET scan, and, and it's already is there any difference in intensity, say between a seven and a nine? Um, difficult to say, and I think one of the, the, the fire questions that were put up there is whether it makes sense to always get a repeat follow-up study on the same scanner using the same tracer. Um, in other words, if you use Postluma, continue to use that. If you used uh, Pylarify, whatever. That, that would make sense. Downgrading in terms of, of grade pathology-wise, I, I don't think the, you can reliably use the SUVs to tell you, although on FDG, Generally speaking, the more something is FDG AVID, typically it's more um, uh, more aggressive, uh, usually poorly differentiated, and so forth. So I don't think there are cutoff SUVs that you could use to help you guide one direction versus the other in terms of grade. But um, I, I think the, the from the as the pathology turned out, I think from um, and the scan how it looked, it looked like localized disease. So it kind of goes with the with the findings. So there's some good teaching points here. Be, the, the biopsies don't always reflect what you find in the radical specimen. I, and uh, I would imagine, uh, Sean, with this, like, this would, and we already said about hormones with, uh, with radiation, and that, that probably would change if you just knew it was a 437. That definitely would have done, I would have done less hormonal therapy. And so uh, this is a very good teaching point for me. Yeah, uh, the uh, and the the other the other thing is about uh, the PET scanning. Be helpful in guiding your some your radiation and your surgery and where uh, and, and margins, particularly where we saw about within the left side. Great discussion, gentlemen. Dave, I have just one thing to also add, and I think this is a comment that uh, Dr. Collins made that I find helpful, and I'll definitely pass along is. A lot of my colleagues don't necessarily report no enlarged or tracer avid lymph nodes. I guess that that that's something that we can bear in mind as we uh, generate some of our reporting to tell you specifically about reports uh, about lymph nodes, excuse me, because depending upon how that is read out, it's going to kind of dictate management if you if this patient had not had surgery. Right. Well, thank you all for this uh, very detailed uh, uh, conversation with a lot of practical points. Thank you.